Please welcome on stage Bernhard Schmidt. So, hello everyone. Um, before I introduce myself, who uh, is under the impression that this, that this talk is about the NEOS content repository? <laughs> okay, spoiler, it isn't. <laughs> this is actually about Starship. Um, as you can see here, um, yeah, that's me, I'm Bernhard Schmidt, I'm working at Zeitgeist, and I'm a member of the NEOS core team for quite some time now, I guess it's like two or three years. Usually um, I get on everyone's nerves with graph theory and um, the interdimensional variation graph, but not today. Uh, today we're uh, doing something really easy. We're building a starship with NEOS. Um, yeah, you can find me on Twitter and uh, GitHub and on the NEOS Slack. Um, yeah, that's my usual name. So um, before we talk about starships, we talk about event sourcing. Um, I guess uh, some people of you will already have heard of it. It's, um, yeah, I, I'll just give a short overview because, yeah, I mean, you can talk like hours about, the, about this topic and we just skip that. So um, what we do is, uh, in, instead of storing the state of something, we just store what happens. And if we want to know anything about the current state, we just look at the events until the current time or the time we're interested in and then we can um, derive the state from that. So that means we model in a temporal way instead of storing the state. Um, we do kind of store the state in so-called projections because um, replaying all the events that happened since the beginning of time might uh, be not as performant as you might need it. So um, we just uh, save something to the database or into a JSON file or uh, send it uh, to some other device, which we'll have a look later, um, and so that you can actually see the state. So, um, we know a thing or two about event sourcing. Let's talk about the Starship. So, um, this is actually a youth hostel somewhere in Bielefeld, and um, once a year, our uh, Star Trek fan community, uh, we haul our uh, complete inventory, it's about two truck loads full of stuff, and uh, replace the usual interior of this building, so I think it's this two or three story thing, uh, with our props that we have. So this is the back of the bridge, for example, and that's me currently configuring the tactical console. And um, the first time I arrived in this room, it was like, whoa, what's going on here? It was a bit, little bit darker than then. And um, I was like this wide-eyed fan and think, okay, you have all this? Does it actually work? And it was like, okay, we have a touch screen here and now it doesn't really work. I'm just, okay, challenge accepted. Let's see what we can do. So, um, yeah, um, we have a little more than just the bridge. For example, um, that's the engine room. So um, that's uh, the warp core here. So you can actually, it's programmable, there's a Raspberry Pi in it, and you can um, program the rings, how they look like, the color they uh, take on, and um, the patterns that run, run along this one. And um, at first it was just like, okay, we have a certain amount of presets and there's a rather ugly PHP interface so you can click on the generic button in your browser and it changes the preset that's running on this. And, um, and the first prototype I brought with me was just, okay, it, it looked like this and it had a few buttons and it was like, okay, let's see how secure this PHP application is. It wasn't. So a few minutes later, we had uh, a very proper designed control panel for the warp core. Um, yeah, then what you can see here is actually um, a rather large touchscreen, which we integrated there. 
um, and you can um, control lots of the, uh, the systems from there, as you would expect from an engine room. So that's um, the hardware we're working with, or parts of that. Um, so what we actually want to do is we write an operating system for this. Um, as a NEOS developer, as well as a kick, all, everyone always says NEOS isn't just a content management system, it's a content application platform. So it should be doable. Uh, so we have some content areas for editors who work with the system while we're playing there, and other parts have to be fully automated. So let's look at some of the challenges uh, that were there when we started this project. Um, at first, we identified uh, some bounded contexts. And the nice thing about Starfleet is it is, um, it is, uh, it is uh, separated into different departments. So this is something that should ring a bell when uh, thinking about bounded contexts. For example, we have like navigation and control, operations, engineering, or the medical department. And in all those fields, we had domain experts. So we actually did interviews, okay, uh, given you are on a starship and you're a medical officer, what interface do you need uh, to, uh, for example, handle your medical files? Um, luckily for us, there's no sales department. <laughs> and um, that uh, made things significantly easier. Uh, one other thing is we have distributed development teams. So we've got the guys that program the Raspberry Pi and the warp core that was done before I even joined the whole project. And um, they do this in C with uh, some very thin PHP layer. And uh, that's something I usually don't mess with. So that's, that's okay, that's a given service. Um, let's build an API for that on the near side and see how far we can get. Then we have uh, more of the hardware guys uh, like uh, using microcontrollers and relays and uh, making everything shiny. Um, and most of those devices also can be accessed via network, for example, using an Arduino and then uh, connecting the pins and so on. Um, yeah, so we had kind of um, the project management um, challenge um, coordinating those teams. Um, but uh, since everyone is so excited about building this thing, this was actually really fun. Um, we also have to deal with legacy devices, which means um, all of those uh, wonderful displays you saw on the bridge are powered by Windows XP. So um, there is no super new Chrome on that. That's, uh, we uh, put there the uh, most recent Firefox that runs on those machines. And most things work, um, but you have to be careful what you do, for example, in JavaScript. And also everyone brings their own uh, mobile device, for example, um, smartphones or tablets, which should work very uh, nicely with this. But you can't rely on any technology constraints. So basically, we have to take care that this works everywhere and isn't too fancy. So let's have a look at what we did. Um, the first console we're looking about is the integrity status console on the bridge. So for example, if the ship gets damaged, um, which is actually simulated in a computer game, uh, which is from somewhat early 2000s and works on Windows XP in compatibility mode. And, um, but it doesn't have a, uh, an outgoing API, so someone has to sit on the bridge and feed all that back to the system status, which is done with this console. So you can just uh, change this. Okay, it's rather broken. And then just send this. And then it will pop up on the different other systems that are connected. For example, the master status console in the, in the engine room, which then uh, plays the typical alarm sound, oh, something's damaged. So whatever happens here is stored in the event store and then distributed 
um, to the, all the other connected systems. So, um, yeah. Most probably, uh, the most fun part is the technical console. Um, there is, uh, the first thing we did was implement uh, alert statuses. So, for example, um, something bad happened and we want to trigger the red alert. Um, then what should happen, actually? What we would like to is that all devices that can react to this should. So all the beautiful, um, mostly analog red lights should go on and all uh, mobile and uh, other devices should turn into alert mode. So how do we do this? And also, this is on a very old touchscreen, which um, cannot probably be connected to the system that, for example, controls um, the Starship in the computer game. So what we did is um, we need some kind of service in the background that distributes all those events to all browsers that are connected and all other devices that are interested. So we set up um, a socket server via Node.js, which does exactly that. So if, for example, we go to, uh, um, we can go to another device, we can use this as well. So if we go to red alert, so the whole ship is in alert mode now. And uh, it's quite fun uh, hearing that alert sound through all the halls in the whole building. So let's get back to normal vibes. Now it also uh, activates the tactical systems, which means um, that now that we're in red alert, we can actually fire photon torpedoes. Um, how do we do that? I mean, this is a touch screen and not a keyboard, and there's a com computer game running. Um, that's where this beauty comes into place. It's an Arduino Leonardo. It can work as a, a computer keyboard and has a network connection. So what we do is, on red alert, or for example, on, uh, on this beautiful torpedo button, uh, we send a JSON serialized um, keyboard command to this device, which then translates to it to an actual um, keyboard press command via the Arduino API. So you press a button here on any device. You can do this on, your, on a mobile phone or on your tablet or presumably on this technical console on the bridge. And um, a few microseconds later, uh, in the computer game, a photon torpedo is fired. And um, that's actually uh, one thing where we get to um, the point, OK, is this event sourceable? I mean, uh, is, is, a, is a torpedo launch actually a projector? But um, actually, it, it isn't, because um, a, projector needs to, a projector needs to be able to replay events. So um, asking your opponent um, to, yeah, can you please reassemble uh, your ship? Uh, we have some error in our uh, torpedo storage, and we want to replay the events that led to that. Uh, isn't quite possible. But then again, having those events in the event store for another projection is actually useful when you want to know what happened then, and you need some kind of report what happened. And this can happen if your commanding officer demands this like at 2 o'clock in the night. So um, let's uh, have a look at the, at the architecture of the system. So as we uh, saw before, here's our tactical console where the browser is running. It uh, connects, it's always connected to the socket server, who then translates this um, this JavaScript event to a key press command on the Arduino, which then actually pu uh, pushes a button in bridge commander. A little more complex are the um, alert statuses because they are sent to m many more devices. For example, you have this set alert status command, which is then first sent to the NEOS um, uh, server, 
uh, stores it in the event store, and um, then sends it uh, via socket server to all the connected devices, who then change uh, their color code, for example, and play those beautiful sounds. And it's also sent to the Arduino, who presses another button in Bridge Commander to enable the red alert in the game. And also there's an LED relay also connected um, to the Leonardo, who which will then uh, turn all the LEDs uh, on the bridge to red. Um, the next thing are damage reports. Um, we call this uh, lovely feature the Klabauta console. So anyone uh, who wants to, uh, who thinks that the engineers in the engine room are, are lazy or don't have enough to do, can just uh, click a few buttons and then all hell will break loose because they get a damage report. Um, yeah, this is sent via this console. Again, stored in the event store. Um, sent via socket IO to the uh, master status console in the engine room. And depending on what system is uh, damaged, it may also shut down the warp core. Um, we also built a graphical user interface for the warp core presets, so you can uh, just click ahead and um, add a few more colorful presets to let them run over the, all the LED arrays on the warp core. You can also um, send them um, to the warp core itself. They are stored as events in the event store. So for example, um, some months ago we switched the um, the API of the warp core and uh, the way the patterns are stored there from some text file to JSON. And all we had to do was, okay, let's replay the events. And uh, we just have uh, the new formatted file that is needed by the target system. So, um, yeah, uh, one thing I also learned in this project is there are actual deadlines in this world. So for most web projects, um, if someone tells you there's a deadline on at that date, and unless there's some kind of conference where something has to be presented, then usually it's some deadline that someone came up with out of thin air. Um, it's a little different in this project because uh, those events uh, that we organize and where we uh, transport to the whole ship um, they happen once a year. So if a feature makes it by the beginning of November, then it's fine. If it's done a week later, yeah, we have to wait a year until the next event. So, um, yeah, that's basically it from me. Um, do we have time for questions? Yes. Are there any? Any questions about event sourcing and Bernhard's starship? <laughs> Thank you for this talk. Are there video recordings of what's going on there? Um, uh, no, we actually explicitly don't do those. There's an interview, though, on the web page um, of uh, our association, and um, it's, it's really fun. Another question? Uh, talking about event sourcing, what would you say is the greatest benefit choosing an event sourced architecture here? Because following your uh, slides, I just see reaction on events, of course, but that's not the benefit of having an event sourcing, isn't it? Yeah, uh, you're right. Um, the interesting parts uh, happen if I mean, if, as long as expected stuff happens, event sourcing never really helps. So, okay, I press this button and I expect uh, something to happen. Uh, that's boring. The interesting parts uh, come up if, uh, when actually something unexpected happens and uh, someone wants a report on something and uh, you didn't see that coming, but you have all the events that happened in, in, this, in the whole system in the events log, 
and you just uh, can uh, say, okay, uh, Captain, uh, what would you like to have in your projection? <laughs> Any other questions? So I, I joined a little bit late, so maybe you explained that in the beginning, so I'm sorry for that if I'm uh, repeating a question that you already answered. Uh, but the question would be, how do you choose a good event store, or in particular, which event store system are you using? Mm -hmm. um, I can just switch to the last slide. Um, we do have an event sourcing and event store package for NEOS, which we also use for the new event sourced content repository. Um, we custom built this for NEOS, and we use this one. Okay, any other questions? If that's not the case, thank you very much, Bernhard, for your presentation.